want to go ahead and just dive straight into what we're going to be talking about. If you have your Bibles and you want to flip with me to the book of Galatians, that's where we're going to be today. Uh, two weeks ago, we started a brand new series in this book. And uh, if you missed the last couple of messages, I've said this, you know, last week, I'll say it again this week. I just want to strongly encourage you to go on our website, listen to those messages, because what we've talked about those last two weeks is really not just like filler. It's like the, the starting point, it's the launch point um, for where everything else we talk about and, and go through is going to, to go from. And, and really, what we did was we began to unpack the theme of Galatians, which is quite simply this. Grace. Grace. That is the theme of Galatians, understanding grace. And the reason that we've discovered the Galatians needed to hear about that theme of grace is because they had abandoned the gospel that they originally heard from Paul, and they had traded it in for a new gospel of performance. So they heard this gospel of grace that, listen, you are not saved by what you do. You have been saved by what someone else has done. And you receive that freely through the grace of Jesus Christ because of his death, burial, resurrection. Okay? So they adopt this false gospel that they needed to do certain laws, whether it was Sabbath or sacrifices and so on. And that is going to be what saved them. So today, we're going to continue exactly where we've left off. And this, this uh, we're, we finished chapter 1 last week, and today we're, we're starting chapter two. So um, just as a refresher, Paul is in the middle of just kind of giving these, these Galatians a bit of his own history. He's describing his own life. He's describing his own experiences and what has happened in, in his own uh, missionary journeys and being involved in the church. And so he's in the middle of a story here, and, and what we're going to do is just pick it up at verse one of chapter two. And Paul says this, he says, then 14 years later, after being converted, I went back to Jerusalem again, this time with Barnabas, and Titus came along too. I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. While I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church and shared with them the message I had been preaching to the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement for fear that all my efforts had been wasted and I was running this race for nothing. And they supported me and did not even demand that my companion Titus be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. Even that question came up only because of some so-called believers there, false ones, really, who were secretly brought in. They sneaked in to spy on us and take away the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. They wanted to enslave us and force us to follow the Jewish regulations but we refused to give in to them for a single moment. We wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel message for you. And the leaders of the church had nothing to add to what I was preaching. By the way, their reputation as great leaders made no difference to me, for God has no favorites. Instead, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews, for the same God who worked through Peter as an apostle to the Jews, also worked through me as an apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as the pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me. And they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles. While they continued to work with the Jews, their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, which I've always been eager to do. Now, this is, this is quite a little narrative that, that he goes through. But what is Paul doing here? Why, what is Paul setting up for us? We're going to find out in just a minute. First, I want to tell you this. Uh, Wall Street Journal columnist uh, Joe Queenan, he made some funny comments regarding the complexity of, of our modern lives just a few years ago. He said this, I bought a sinus rinse the other day. Just a basic, no frills, sinus rinse. In making the purchase, I thought that rinsing out my sinuses would be a fairly straightforward operation. Boy, was I wrong. For starters, there was the package. Colorful diagrams and instructions covered the sinus rinse box, including a long list of the 10 advantages of using this particular sinus rinse. But the sinus rinse makers were just getting warmed up. Inside the box, I found a 32-page manual with an introduction, 
testimonials from physicians and customers, warnings about the mishandling of the device, a full page of instructions for cleaning and disinfecting the unit, and four pages of answers to frequently asked questions about sinus rinses. The manual literally contained tens of thousands of words, all in tiny, tiny print. He concluded by saying that American society suffers from a plague of things that are, quote, far too complicated. And you see, by living in a world that is constantly reminding us of just how complicated life truly is, I think that within each one of us, there is this desire and this, this gravitation towards wanting to latch onto something that's just simple, right? Everything seems so complex. And in the last couple of years, we've learned that life can just become everly increasing in, in complexity just by a couple of events happening around us that are outside of our control. And you see, in the midst of all the over information, that is overwhelming us, the complex problems that are confusing us, disorienting us, all of the unknowns about the future and what life is going to look like. We dream about something simple. And guys, in one way, I believe God has quenched that desire for simplicity in our lives. Um, we, we find something uniquely simple in the gospel. You see, the gospel can be simple. It can be. For instance, it's relatively simple you think about this with me, to know and understand that in and of ourselves we're people that are separated from God, that we're born into sin, that we don't, we, we don't have connection with God in and of our own selves, that we needed a perfect sacrifice only Jesus could provide in order to pay for our sin, and that when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he extended victory to us over death. He conquered death, and he extends that same victory over to us as his people. You see, at its core, that is the gospel message in its most simplistic form. And the gospel is simple enough so that even small children are able to know and follow Jesus at very young ages, right? But, there's, there's, there's a but here. We have to remind ourselves that the simple understanding of the gospel is only the starting point towards mature faith in Jesus, Okay? It's only the starting point. While Jesus is clear, we like to talk about this, and it's very true. Jesus is very clear that we must have childlike faith in order to enter the kingdom of God. But Paul, in one of his letters, at the same time is clear that our faith must not remain childish. There is a difference between childish faith and childlike faith. And the, pur the purpose of understanding the difference is what we'll see right here from Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 11 and 12. This is what Paul said. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now, we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then... I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. What Paul is saying here is quite explicit, that the way we thought, the way that we reasoned, the way that we spoke and understood our faith as children will not be enough as we grow into adulthood. In a child's eyes, things are always simple. Um, that's why when Mackenzie, my three-year-old, asks me, why the sun is in the sky, it's very difficult to explain that, right? Because that's not simple, is it? It's simple that God gave us the sun, but what holds that sun into place is very, very, very complex. You see, in a child's eyes, things are black or they're white. They're either right or they're wrong. But as we grow up, we begin to realize that not everything is as simple as we once assumed that it was. What we're, do, we're, we're forced to navigate the complexity of a very gray world. And at times, we're offered no answers on the things that we're facing. So when we experience this disorientation, what often people do is they just reject their faith. 
and they say, well, this has no answers for me. And they, they, they're looking to their simplistic first introduction to Christianity to, to just whitewash everything that they face for the rest of their journey as human beings. But when we experience that disorientation, what Paul says is, hey, it's normal. What you're going through is normal. He says what? We see things how? Imperfectly. Like puzzling reflections in a mirror. He says that uh, becoming mature in our faith is the beginning to see that the simple, clear understanding that we once had of life and God, it's not necessarily the full picture. And again, while I want to stress this, the gospel is simple in that it liberates us from the confusion that we so often feel in the world by offering us an answer, that there is a God that loves us. But when we accept what seems simple and we continue in it and we press in in our faith and a few years go by, we find that properly understanding this simple gospel. We find that properly living out this gospel, engaging this gospel, let it, it totally and completely take over our lives. Guys, that's anything but simple. That is very complex. In fact, I will say this, most of the heresies that have been birthed throughout the history of the church stem from an oversimplification of who God is. We want to simplify God, don't we? Because that's the only way we'll understand him. We can't understand this complex God. So we try to make it simple. And without getting into the weeds this morning, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this and go through all of these different heresies. But there are, I want to just mention a few of them. Um, various heresies that have been rejected by the church that every single one of them are birthed from a place of, hey, let's, let's make God more easy to understand. Okay, so whether it's Gnosticism, Triumphalism, Docetism, Pelagianism, all of these heresies, they stem from, I, I want to take God who's so complex and I want to reduce him down into something that, that makes sense to me as a finite human being, and we end up just marring this God that we see in Scripture. And each of those heresies, while important to understand, um, I, want, I want to add one more to the list this morning that we're going to talk about. One other heresy that is pervasive in the church today, and that looks to oversimplify what is in fact very complex. And that heresy is legalism. Legalism. So, this problem of legalism is exactly what Paul is dealing with when he's talking to the, the Galatians in the text that we read to start. So here's my question. What is legalism? What is it? If we go down to the core, simply put, legalism is trusting in our action rather than God's action as the means for grace in our lives. I want to say that again. Legalism is trusting in our action rather than God's action as the means to grace in your life. So what does Paul do? He hears that these people are living in a legalistic uh, way of life, a legalistic theology. So what does Paul do? He takes him back to his first experience with legalism. He reminds the Colossians that circumcision, you see these, these Galatians, they were insisting that if you want to be saved, you better get circumcised. You better adhere to the Sabbath. You better make those animal sacrifices because if you don't, then it's not enough. Okay? And, and this is what Paul begins to do. He begins to say, listen, that's not what saves you. That's not what saves you. While Maybe some of these things are important. It's not what saves you. So Paul wants to be clear that this is not the first time I've dealt with legalism. And he puts it into context for him. He talks about Jerusalem and what happened when he was in Jerusalem. And what, what does he say when he, when he happened this? He says, I completely and totally rejected these false ones and what they were trying to put on me. He brings them back to the gospel they first heard that gospel of grace. That's the same gospel. He goes out of his way to say, hey, you know the three guys that Jesus Christ poured into the most, Peter, James, and John? Okay, those are the guys that are approving what I'm saying to you as being from Jesus. This is about grace, not what you're saying it's about. So he's, he's appealing to his authority. He's saying, hey, these guys, they're affirming what I'm saying, so now you ought to as well. So, all in all, from that long story we see from Paul, 
He's telling an example which really just helps us see a wholesale rejection of legalism as being Christian in any way, shape, or form. Legalism is not from God. And Paul makes it very clear. So that's the start today. If we're going to talk about legalism, the first step is seeing in Scripture that it is not from God. But that is only the start. And that is why so many Christians are aware that legalism is wrong, but they aren't attuned or seeing how it's affecting their own life. And we have to dig a little bit deeper if we're going to get there. So I want to tell you this story. There was once a, a man, and he planted a garden. And he, he spent a lot of time on it, and he was delighted when, when he saw these shoots begin to emerge in the garden that he'd worked so hard on. So every day he's out there, he's watering, he's weeding, he's, uh, you know, tending to this garden. And then those shoots turn into plants, and, and they're just getting bigger, they're healthy. But then a few days later, he goes to his garden, and he's shocked because every plant he had worked so hard to, to keep alive was showing evidence of rodents and rabbits that had raided his produce. So what did he do? He decided, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a fence. A few days later, he um, goes to his garden, see if the fence worked, um, and it doesn't work. So um, he goes from there. Every time, he, he, he just keeps checking and checking. He found animals had raided his garden, so he, he comes up with a new idea. Okay, I'm not just going to put a fence up. I'm going to literally pour cement. I'm going to build a foundation. I'm going to build this thing up even higher. So then weeks later, he finally climbs in. He looks down on his garden, and he's horrified to see that the whole thing was choked with weeds. The ground was cracked. The plants were wilted. And worst of all, his produce was, was gone. You see, trusting in the wall's protection, he had forgotten to tend to the garden entirely. He spent all his energy trying to keep things out that he didn't spend any time any longer like he did at first, trying to tend to what was already within. You see, he was failing to realize that the, the, the wall was blocking the sun's rays. He completely overlooked that the greatest that threat to his garden was not just uh, the, the results he was seeing, but that the, the animals were already within the whole time. And guys, my, my question for you today is how many of us do the same thing by trusting in our walls rather than in God's grace. We trust more in our walls to keep sin out than we do in God's grace to change our hearts from within. You see, this alone is the heart of legalism. Our carefully built boundaries, they protect us from threats to our moral well-being, to our relationships, and so on. You see, with legalism, we're, we're always trying to keep things out there from coming in here. And that's a noble cause at first, right? I don't want sin. I don't want temptation. I don't want to fail. I don't want to have these things affecting my life. So we build up walls, and they come in the form of rules. And we say, if I just don't do this, and if I just don't do that, and if I make sure that I don't go near this, then I'm going to be righteous. But guys, we find that this strategy will never work. Because just like the gardener, eventually we realize that the problem lies in what has already made its way inside your heart. You see, sin is already deeply within each and every one of our souls. No matter how many rules we make, walls we build, or barriers we erect, we can't change that. And the allure, the thing that draws us in with legalism, is that it convinces you of a lie that with hard work, you can make yourself righteous. Listen, just work hard. Just protect yourself. Keep your heart right. Just do this. Just do that. And what do we do? We think that we can bypass God to get right with God. And we think, if I can just, I'll, I'll fix myself. I'll make sure that this thing comes out the way I want. So let's be clear before we head too far off that we do have boundaries from God and God's law. We have the Ten Commandments. We have, we have boundaries. And while God's law is good, let's be clear again, like Paul says, it doesn't save you. The law doesn't save you. So let's think about this. If God's law, perfect in every way, is not enough to save you, 
or to transform your heart, why do we believe that our own rules will be enough to do so? What we ultimately see from the book of Galatians in this opening part of this chapter is that legalism, again, it's not from God. And if we think about it, we, we be, might begin to ask, well, why do I turn to this? Why would I even want to live in this place of legalism? Well, it's quite simple. We want to protect ourselves. We don't want this invisible God with his invisible grace to try to protect us from sin when we could just do it ourselves. I'll just make sure that I've got this thing taken care of. We rely and trust in a dead system of rules, behavior, and so on, rather than in the living, breathing person of Jesus Christ. So here's how this plays out, guys. You can objectively know that legalism is wrong, that it's not the answer for how you ought to live your life. But without learning how to recognize it and look within and say, yep, that's a tendency I have, that's legalistic, then we're going to miss how it's destroying your walk with God, how it is destroying your relationship with, with others because it's just made its way in and we keep building walls to protect what is already rotting from the inside out. So in order to be challenged in how to do that, we've got to go somewhere else in Scripture. Thank God for Paul. He wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. You can read the whole chapter later. For the sake of time, we're going to read the first eight verses. But again, this is Paul, and I want you to just focus in. We can just sit up, take a deep breath. We're reading a lot of Scripture this morning, but it's important because what we're doing is we're allowing God to just begin to challenge us in some things that maybe we've never been challenged on. So Paul says this, Now regarding your question, Corinthians are asking a question, about food that has been offered to idols. Yes, we know that we, quote, all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers really doesn't know much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. So what about eating meat that's been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god and that there is only one god. There may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that's been offered to idols, they think of it as worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it, and we don't gain anything if we do. What in the world is Paul talking about? Okay, this is what was happening. Animals come in. They're in pagan Rome, as we talked about two weeks ago. And what was a custom is you were constantly making sacrifices to all of these gods. So these animals come in, they're sacrificed in the temples to, a, to, a, to an idol, to a god. And then, in order to make money, these people would dog, take those animals that were sacrificed and killed on the altar of an idol, and they would go sell it in the marketplace. And these Christians are coming to the marketplace trying to get food. Some Christians are just buying what they can, even though it was offered to an idol, because that's all they can afford. And other Christians are saying, no, 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 you can't eat that because it was offered to an idol. And Paul brings clarity. And he comes in and says, okay, some of you are eating this food. Some of you aren't. You're asking me what's right, what's wrong. Let's talk about this. And what does he do? Does he say black, white? Or does he say, this is a little gray? He says, let's, let's talk about this. For those of you that feel really, really convicted when you do this, it's sin. For, for me, I don't feel, Paul, Paul says, for me, I, I, there's no idols. They're just fictitious. So for me, I know that you know, when I bless my food in Jesus' name, and I'm covering it, and that, that it's acceptable for me to eat. So they're, they're asking Paul for answers. And some of, some of this is really important for us to grab hold of because these, these Christians were getting offended. They're looking at their, their other brothers and sisters in church. They're saying, why are you in sin? Why are you eating that? It's wrong. 
it's, it's, it's messed up. So they're, they're bringing Paul in kind of as a referee. So here's the question. They ask, you know, is it okay to eat this food or not? Is it sin or is it not? And again, Paul brings clarity. He says that you don't gain anything by eating it. You don't, you don't lose anything by not eating it. Food is neutral. It's not right. It's not wrong. Therefore, his conclusion is it's not sin to eat food offered to idols for those who did not feel convicted by it. They simply ate it. But for others who felt like it was wrong, they should avoid it because it violated their conscience. And Paul says, listen, follow your conscience. If it feels wrong to you and it feels like sin, then be obedient to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and don't eat it. So guys, what does that mean for you and for me and our understanding of sin, our understanding of grace, our understanding of legalism this morning? You see, first of all, I don't know about you, but I've never encountered that problem in my life of whether or not I should eat food offered to idols. That's not, a, that's not something I deal with in this culture. But you see, we deal, we deal with variations that are similar to this, that we have to translate and have the discernment to bring Paul's wisdom into it. And so even though I don't deal with food offered to idols, what are some of the other situations that I do deal with that Paul and, and God the Holy Spirit through him can begin to speak to us and help us understand. First of all, guys, what we, what we see is that while there are black and white distinctions for sin, we need to be very clear. Because some false gospels like to say, listen, just go with your gut. Whatever you go with, it's fine. Just, just make sure that you feel good about it. That's not what I'm saying. God is very clear that there are black and white distinctions for sin. So let's, let's, we're going to use examples this morning to make sense of this. It is always sin to commit adultery. Black, white, always sin. There is no scenario in which adultery is not sinful according to the Bible. But we find in many other cases that sin is not easily defined. It's not so simple in other cases. And that's why Paul starts off by saying, listen, listen, while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. We want to know this is right, this is wrong, and we feel empowered with that knowledge. But Paul's saying, hey, slow down and ask yourself this question. Are you being driven by love first? Before you start making judgments about what is right and wrong, are you being driven by love for God and love for people? And we need to hear those same words as well. Paul is saying, stop allowing your knowledge of the rules to override your love for other people. Stop judging other people. Now, when we give into legalism, it is judgment and hypocrisy that is so often the result. When we live this way, we can be sure that eventually we're going to run into one of those two things. Hypocrisy, judgment, maybe both. I'll tell you a quick story. that In 2013, uh, this happened in New York City. I did some research, and uh, there was a narcotics agent, a uh, group of agents that they announced an unusual indictment against five Brooklyn men. And these types of indictments are, unfortunately, they're very common in metropolitan areas like New York City, but this one stood out, uh, as you'll soon see why. See, these men were charged, um, the men that who, who were charged were members of a Sabbath-observing drug ring. You heard me right. Sabbath-observing drug ring. So even though they were cavalier about New York's drug laws, the group was meticulous about observing the Sabbath. So when they got caught, they found text messages on these guys' phones from the members of the gang that show them alerting their clientele, hey, listen, come get your drugs now because in 10 minutes we're starting Sabbath, okay? Text messages are used as evidence, uh, groups to, to chats with clients, um, you see, this is what was happening in this thing. And the name of the NYPD sting operation that led to this bus was called Only After Sundown. Aptly named. Um, you see, guys, this, this is what legalism does to unsuspecting Christians. This is exactly what it does. While we religiously follow certain rules to the letter of the law, I'm going to observe the Sabbath. I'm going to make sure that I don't work on the seventh day. At the very same time, we are actively living in the sin that we've so desperately tried to avoid through judging people, 
They're becoming spiritually proud. Here I am, get it together, living hypocritical, calling this sin, but living in a different sin. You see, judgment, self-righteousness, hypocrisy, they, 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 they sneak in. And that's why some, they're some of the hardest sins to deal with, because they're invisible. We don't see them. They're not overt. We can be reading our Bibles. We can be praying hours throughout the day, but our hearts are prideful. And we're judging people who don't have it together like we do. So here's my question. How might this look in our lives? I want to talk very candidly about two highly debated topics in certain Christian circles today. So let's, let's talk about food, food offered to idols, and let's contextualize it. Let's make it, okay, 2022, how can we take Paul's wisdom and apply it here? Let's talk about alcohol. Let's talk about modesty. Let's just talk about those two things real quick. Let's start with alcohol, okay? In Ephesians 5, we're told explicitly that we are not to get drunk with alcohol. But instead, what well, Paul says, he said, don't get filled with, with alcohol and become drunk. He says, be filled with the Spirit. So that much is clear. Becoming drunk is sin. However, people all throughout Scripture did drink alcohol in moderation, including Jesus himself. You see, in fact, we even look that Jesus' first miracle was taking water and turning it into alcoholic wine. Not grape juice, as some people claim. That's just not true. Um, and it was at a wedding. People were celebrating. It wasn't for some holy thing. It was a wedding. People were celebrating. So while we are commanded very clearly in Scripture, do not become drunk, there is literally nowhere in Scripture that prohibits directly the consumption of alcohol. So what does that mean? It means that some Christians deeply believe that drinking alcohol in moderation is not sin. It means that other believers believe that it is very strongly so, sin. And again, what I would say and submit to us is that this is a version of our food offered to idols. And as such, we have to apply Paul's wisdom. You see, our job is not to determine what is sin for someone else. It is to lovingly live out our own convictions before God without judging anyone else. So, what does that mean? It means that if you feel as though drinking alcohol is wrong, then you shouldn't do it. It means that if you strongly have sought the Lord and, and believe that in moderation it's not a temptation, a temptation for you to overuse, then you seek the Lord and you live with him in obedience. So let's explore another example, modesty, okay? All you have to do is look around the world and begin to see that modesty changes from culture to culture. What I mean is that depending on whether you're a person from Africa or a person from Europe, from Asia, from North America, and so on, your understanding of modesty is going to be completely different depending on where in the world you grew up, okay? And even though there are lots of variations in modesty across the world, one thing is consistent in virtually every culture is that it is offensive. It is completely and totally unacceptable to be nude in public. That is just across the board. No matter where you go, that's wrong, right? And we also see this in Scripture because when sin entered the world, God created a paradise in, in Eden where Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. But when sin entered the world, what was one of the first things God does? He gives them clothing. Now, we don't know what that clothing looked like. We don't know exactly. All we know is that God made clothing from the skins of animals, okay? I want to show some extremes here because, again, we're talking about legalism and how do we view our world through a lens of grace and love while still adhering to orthodoxy about sin. So I want to show extremes here. There are some Christians who devoutly believe it is immodest for women to wear pants of any kind, that they should only wear very long skirts or dresses, and that anything else is immodest and scandalizing. Other Christians, however, 
believe that women can wear bikinis and still live out modest lives in the context of what is normal in our current culture. So, again, this is our variation of food offered to idols. We have to understand that what we have is a conviction. And what we do is we take that conviction and we copy it and paste it in everyone we're seeing. And then that causes judgment. And then that causes status. And then it causes more of it. And before long, we, we have become so blind to the legalism and the judgment and how I've got it together and how much sin they're living in. And boy, you better pray for them. My goodness. But we've settled into something that isn't from God. So whether or not a believer is in sin in these areas, it's not something we can fully know with certainty, nor is it our job to know. It is between them and God. It is between them and God. But what we do know for certain, you see, we don't know. If someone's doing this, we don't agree with it. We don't know necessarily in some of these areas whether it's sin for them or not. But what we know for certain is that we are in sin when we judge fellow believers for not adhering to the convictions that we hold to be most true in our own lives. I want to tell you one more story. There was a warm spring evening. It was in 1998. It's a long time. It feels like a long time ago. 15-year-old African-American boy. His name was uh, Christopher Searcy. And he was playing basketball with some of his friends. And he was a uh, half a block from Ravenswood Hospital just outside of Chicago. And while he was playing basketball, three teenage Latino gang members looking for a black target approached and shot young Searcy in the abdomen. And his friends frantically grabbed him. They carried him 30 feet of the hospital, and then they ran inside to go get help to try to save their friend. But here's what happened. The emergency room personnel, they refused to go outside and help this young man who was dying. And the reason was they cited a policy that only allows them to help people who are inside of the hospital. So the boys getting no help. They go outside and they call the police who come and attend to their wounded friend. And when the officers arrive on the scene, they proceeded to call an ambulance. Keep in mind, they're 30 feet from the hospital. They refused to carry the boy inside. And while passerbys pled with the officer to go put that boy in the hospital, he's laying in a pool of blood unconscious. And after several minutes, the ambulance had not yet arrived. Finally, the police gave in and they carried the boy into the emergency room. But, but at that point, it had been too long and nothing could be done to save his life. And guys, as is so often true, when we legalistically insist on the letter of the law, the needs of others are overlooked. By holding to a standard operating procedure of the law, then another law is overruled, the law of love. And initially, the hospital passionately defended themselves. Hey, this is our policy. We only help people here. And, but it was only after their, their town went crazy and the amount of backlash that they faced that they finally gave in and changed their policy to say, we will not only help people inside, but anyone on the premises. See, guys, here's the thing about legalism. It is deadly. Legalism is deadly. Not only will it kill you, it'll kill the people around you. You see, just as strict rules kept the hospital from helping a wounded boy right outside their doors, it'll also keep you from being able to help the people around you who need it. Because legalism keeps us in a frame of judgment. But grace enables us to reach out, to love people. And guys, I don't know about you, but I don't think people need more Christian rules explained to them, to people who don't follow Jesus. What they need is the empowering and overwhelming grace of Jesus. So, you know, his kindness leads us to repentance, not his rules. His law is perfect, but his love is as well. Again, guys, I think it's so important that we balance this. Are there rules 
Are there black, white, and, and blacks? Are there, are there very clear things that are sin and very clear things that are not? Of course. But not all of life is that way. And we have to understand that one thing is clear. And that, that, that clarity is that until you receive grace for yourself, you are not going to be able to offer grace to anyone else. You cannot give something away that you don't personally possess for your own soul. And I just want to be honest with you guys this morning, because this, this sermon, I spent a lot of time on it this week, because let me, just, let me just tell you, legalism is tempting for me. Very tempting for me. My personality, man, oh man, um, do, I, do I really like being able to look to myself to just live my life a certain way and be pleasing to God? Oh yeah, that's... That's easier than, than grace. And let me just tell you, I'm very hard on myself. I can be very hard on myself. I, gotta, I, I am type one. I, I want to get it right. I want to do it the right way. I want to make sure that I'm, that I'm above board, that I'm doing this. So that means grace is hard for me to receive. But guys, I'll tell you what, several, several years ago, God began to work in me and show me just the extent of how, how I was living. And at that point, I received grace for myself. And it was only then that I could begin to give it to other people. It changed my marriage, changed my relationships, because I was so hard on myself, I was being hard on Steph. I was being hard on the people around me, because I'm living up to this standard. Everyone else needs to as well. But God shows us that grace softens us. It gives us the ability to rest in who God is. And you know... Maybe you know quite a bit about the Bible. Maybe you know the do's and don'ts of Christianity and so forth. But maybe at the same time, you know very little of grace for yourself. Living in and receiving forgiveness and deep grace for you as a person. You see, that's God's heart and desire for you. He wants you to live in his grace. And again, I think part of the reason, if I'm just being honest, that so few Christians are excited to reach out to those around them with the good news of Jesus is because the gospel they understand isn't the gospel of grace. It's the yoke and the burden of legalism. Why share that with anyone? I'm miserable. Why don't you come be miserable with me? I mean, seriously. No, but when we taste grace, we say, you, you got to come hear about this God. You got to come experience this. You don't have to, you don't have to live enslaved to that. Come on, I, I'll show you. Come, come with me. Let's go to church. Let's, let's hear about this Jesus. Isn't that different from, man, I'm depressed because I just don't have it together. I just can't, I can't stop feeling like a wreck. I, can't, I mean, let's begin to be people who see that God is offering us something that we're probably not fully taking advantage of. As it turns out, guys, the, the key to, to our message today, the key to overcoming legalism is simply embracing the thing that you've been trying to navigate around. Grace. Legalism opposes grace. It, it forces the issue of, I have to earn it. I have to do it. Legalism leads us to judging people, but grace leads us to help people. Legalism teaches you to earn, to work hard. Grace teaches you how to receive, how to rest. You see, with grace, you can't place your hope in anything that you can do. With grace, you have to learn to trust in something outside of your control and your performance. And guys, today, I, I'm, I'm not just saying this. This isn't just something I wrote out in my sermon. My prayer for you today is, is very simple. I, I pray that you would experience grace in the person of Jesus so that the deadly sting of legalism can lose its grip on your life. Because guys, as much as this is for other people, it is so much for you. Because let me tell you, the Christian life is very miserable when you are enslaved to legalism. And it is a heresy. It is not from God. And it is, it is foundational that before we, before we can begin to really reach people, we've got to let God's grace reach us. Fully, profoundly, deeply. I want to ask you to bow with me. We need your grace 
this morning, Lord. And we, we need to understand grace differently than we probably have. It's not just, it's not just an excuse for sin. It's not just, uh, oh yeah, you don't, you're, not, you're not going to hell anymore because you prayed that prayer. No, grace is power. I love what Dallas Willard says. He says like a 747 burns jet fuel on takeoff. That, that's what grace is to the believer. We burn through it and we need, we need moment by moment grace to, to be empowered in this life. So Lord, that's my prayer right now. Empowerment, to be able to see in, in every single part of, of our own hearts where we've been affected by legalism. I, I gave a couple of examples today, Lord, but there's, there's so many we could talk about. Where are we looking to protect ourselves with walls? Where are we looking to just completely do this thing on our own strength? We love you so desperately. Would you break our hearts so that we could stop being so hard on ourselves to receive your grace and at the same time be soft with others? We love you, Lord. We need you to do this. We can't do it ourselves. And I pray that this week would be just, just the start of something. The start of freedom in so many of my brothers and sisters' lives with you. I ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.